Eliska, thank you very much for joining and taking the time today. Could you let us know a little bit more about yourself? Thank you very much for having me. It's it's a pleasure. I am Eliska. I'm from the Czech Republic, from Prague. And I teach Czech for foreigners, even though I don't like to call myself a teacher because I believe that people should learn languages and they shouldn't be taught languages. It's impossible that somebody teaches you a language. I think it has to be you who learns the language. So that's why I don't really like the word teacher. So I okay. see myself more as a um, guide, mentor, support for my clients. Do you have an alternative for teacher? Yeah, that's a problem. I should probably label it for marketing purposes. So I'm still <laughs> looking for for the ideal word. Um, I also use coaching principles in my sessions. I see myself a little bit as a language coach, a little bit as a mentor, a little bit as a teacher, of course, mm -hmm. a little bit as a guide. So um, something in between. What services do you offer? Do you do individual courses or do you have like group sessions? And I, I believe you have a YouTube channel. What's what, what's your system behind all that? What's the mm -hmm. vision? Mm -hmm. I don't teach uh, beginners. I focus on more advanced students. So you would be my ideal client, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I don't do group sessions. I only work with individual clients because I always try to tailor my sessions to their exact needs. So we really um, speak about how they like to learn, what's their specific goal, and I help them find an, an effective study routine so that it mm -hmm. makes fun, they enjoy the process and it's effective. So this is, these are my individual sessions. Um, my target group or main audience are people from English speaking countries, especially Americans, a little bit of people from German speaking countries. And um, yeah, I also create and sell online courses. So currently you can buy a pronunciation course, and then a course or program where you can learn how to learn Czech effectively. And I have a YouTube channel where I share my thoughts on learning and teaching Czech. And I also share grammar videos, vocabulary, pronunciation videos. And the channel is called Because Czech is Cool. Yeah, because Czech is cool. So it's true. <laughs> Perfect. So we will, we will put a link uh, down below to your courses and also to your channel so that everyone mm -hmm. who wants to find you can find you but i think it's fairly easy if you just type in because czech is cool your channel will come up how many languages do you speak english obviously czech anything else uh i speak german german used to be my strongest language but i haven't spoken german in seven years so right i think if i spoke it i would be okay but we can auch ein bisschen deutsch sprechen aber es ist schon lange her um <laughs> Yeah, so German, English, and I also speak Spanish because I lived in Mexico for almost three years. Okay, impressive. So four, four languages and maybe someday we can do an interview in German. Mm -hmm. But for now, let's, let's stick to English. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how to learn a language and what your experiences in the Czech Republic are and what my experiences in Germany are. Um, what is your experience with the Czech school system, how languages are taught, what, what are maybe positive aspects, if any, and what would you uh, change, what would you modify, what do you, what do you consider negative? Mm -hmm. I like how you said, if any, positive aspects, if any. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned Spanish on my own, but I learned English and German at school. And I would mm -hmm. say that we always use the traditional classical system. So it would start with a textbook, with uh, reading a lot of texts. Uh, memorizing grammar rules, um, memorizing lists of isolated vocabulary, right? So, das Buch, Kniha, just like yeah. one word with no context, with no, like, um, no, no phrases, no full sentences. And I remember that I was, I would always learn the grammar somehow, learn the vocabulary to pass the test, but I yeah. wasn't really able to put it all together to create a sentence to communicate. And I think this is a problem at school in general, that we learn the language as a subject. So we actually study the language. We study about it, about the rules and about the, the principles, but we don't learn how to use it as a tool to communicate. Because I think that languages are, mm, like when you speak or use a language, it's a skill, right? It's like mm -hmm. when you learn how to swim or how to cook, you have to do it, you have to practice, you have to do it uh, over and over again. 
And I think that this was the biggest problem in my case, that I wasn't taught how to do this. And also, I remember that I didn't have any friends, any foreign contacts at that time. So I I had no motivation to actually learn the language because, yeah. like, what for, right? How, how, yeah. why should I do it? And I regret that none of my teachers ever told me or showed me the beauty of learning languages not none of them ever told me like elishka you can make new friends you can travel you can uh, watch movies and series in the original version so this is also what i missed or i miss it now back then i wasn't really aware of it but now i miss it like this support and the motivation from the side of my teachers understand uh, <clears throat> i totally agree with you do you or did you have any exchange programs where you would go to for instance germany if you had german or to an english-speaking country yeah, yeah, yeah we had some exchange programs i was in germany once and i was even in egypt once like to communicate in german with students from a german school because mm -hmm. because i studied at a german school and okay. there was one really cool thing about being at a german school in prague because the lessons as such weren't really like interesting for me and I've already described them. But what was great was that at a certain point we would be taught biology, physics or um, art in German. And at that point I actually started needing the language. It wasn't mm -hmm. about the language itself anymore, about grammar or vocabulary, but it was about learning something else using the language as a tool and i think that was amazing because that was that was the moment where it really clicked and i realized oh i can use the language as a tool to communicate with my teacher to answer the teacher to write papers to present something in front of the class so that was the biggest positive aspect i would say yeah that's in my experience also very important we had a we had different special kinds of classes some were focusing on music so if you play an instrument you can go there i went there playing saxophone at the piano and then you had one that was focusing on english at that time and there you had biology physics and so on and it was really just a tool and there i would assume this level of embarrassment that for me is always present when i just focus on the language to speak correctly that was gone because you mm -hmm. needed to communicate a point i was introduced to languages via school and mm -hmm. i think that was i wasn't aware as a child that there are different languages because we at home spoke german and uh, my family they didn't travel too much back in the day so they didn't speak too many languages and i didn't hear it i wasn't exposed to those and in school i learned okay there's something else but then again all those points you come um play a big role in why it wasn't so much fun learning the language and how was your this is really something that interests me how was your experience with teachers did you have the feeling that you had a, a good a calm learning atmosphere or was it focused on not making mistakes and you get the feeling that you really are stupid if you don't know this word now uh, and you're intimidated by the teachers because mm. i had those didn't help me learning the language. I don't really remember feeling intimidated in the class. Mm -hmm. So I, I assume they were supportive in that sense. And I think it was also because it was a German school, even though based in Prague, because I think Czechs are even more focused on like not making mistakes more than Germans, I think. But I can definitely feel this in the Czech um, educational system. like the the grades right you get something wrong you get uh, um, a worse grade and we don't focus again on expressing our thoughts on thinking on connecting information together but we only focus on this is the answer this is this is the question this is the correct answer if you don't say it correctly you failed so yeah. I, I think it's definitely a, a problem because then we grow up and we are afraid of making mistakes and it's it's normal to make mistakes and and healthy mm -hmm. i would i would add because mm -hmm. that's how we learn right mm -hmm. and if i if we speak czech which we've done in the past and i have the feeling okay she doesn't understand then i know what i just said doesn't work at all mm -hmm. so next time i will try to to say it differently when we talk about ways how to improve language learning 
what would your recommendations be? How can I or everyone who's watching learn a language more effectively and more efficiently? What, what's, your, what's your approach? I would start with um, thinking about the why, because this is what I missed when I was at school. I didn't see the point in learning the language. And I feel that sometimes people learn it because they, um, I don't know, their boss tells them they should improve their check or, you know, they should learn it for the family. But they don't, I know, I have a lot of clients who live in Prague and they don't actually need the language because mm. everybody in Prague speaks English. So it's just like, okay, so I should probably learn it because I live here. So I think this is the starting point, like discover your why, why do you want to do it? And what will change when you learn the language? Like yeah. all these amazing things, imagine all these amazing things that will happen when you learn the language. Then I think that you should take responsibility. So stop depending on your teacher or a language school and expect them to teach you the language, but really, um, take responsibility for the learning process and uh, realize that it's you and you only who can learn it. And I wouldn't be afraid to tell my teacher, even though I have a teacher, I always tell them, what is it that I want, how I want to do it? And I, I am the client, right? Mm. I am paying you for the services. So I should be the one who is in charge. And I think it's about the mindset shift Mm -hmm. that I stop depending on somebody somebody else and it's me who who owns the learning process and I think once you start owning the learning process it's it's suddenly something exciting because now it's yours you can decide what you learn how you learn it and it's not the the um, the passive feeling where a teacher tells you okay Eliska so today the textbook page 30 exercise 5 yeah. and we're like okay so let's do it but it's you mm. who decides what what you want to learn so i think like the main in my point of view the main thing is about the mindset mm. and then we can speak about some strategies maybe later what do you think yeah i, I would 100 percent agree with you um the motivation is really a strong factor and motivator to do these difficult steps that are needed to learn a new, new language um, children are able to do it so it cannot be that hard but you have to have the right environment and the right approach i just remembered the languages i learned so english i learned because i had to and then i thought okay i needed more in professional life so i focused actively on watching uh, different movies series uh, youtube channels in english and now i only do that in english if it's the original language because the quality is much better so you gain a lot when you are able to speak the language and you can speak to so many people in english um, and check a little bit less people, but still you can you can use it. Um, and the motivation, thinking about Swedish now, when I was in the university, I decided two years before I went to Sweden that I wanted to go there. So I had two years to get to a certain level. My goal was B1, to be able to communicate in that country because I had the experience living in Spain um, many years ago, but I worked at a German school, as a matter of fact, but there, they, of course, spoke German and it was required and requested. And when you work the whole day in the evening, you maybe want to see some friends, you're tired. It's very hard to sit down and start learning or even communicating in a foreign language. And yeah, my Spanish didn't really get to this C1 level. So I was really sad about that. So for Sweden, I said, I'm going to change it now. And I try to, and this is from my side, a, a big recommendation for everyone who wants to learn a new language. I try to set the system up in Sweden that I would have to use Swedish as a tool, as a means of communicating with people, as a means of like daily life, right? So I wanted to study in Sweden, in Swedish, with everyone else who is native from Sweden. Didn't work in the end because the <laughs> university said, no, we don't do that which they didn't tell me before, but okay. you know, like two years ago when I said, okay, I want to go, can I do it? Yeah, sure. And now I couldn't. So I couldn't continue studying my fields of study uh, in Swedish, but they had a program where they would teach full-time at the university Swedish. This also worked. So I had some English courses and then Swedish. There, people were from other foreign countries. So it wasn't ideal, but still most times of the day I was exposed to Swedish. And I would recommend that for every language. And here, as we talked about the school system, I might want to add some positive experiences. 
from this unit time in the university because they also of course worked with the textbook they worked with a lot of material there but the approach there was just to try to communicate yeah we focus on topics but what do you want to do here what book what do you want to read okay read it tell us about it and then they had very frequently interviews and different exams and it wasn't just as we often have in germany one or two in a year and it's a big exam and you're very stressed they had a lot of small ones and then mm -hmm. you would film yourself and make a recording and it was really a good atmosphere this teacher i'm not going to say her name but it was fantastic fantastic approach so the swedish way was really good that i experienced there that sounds amazing and by the way what you mentioned with um, the swedish university that you wanted to study there in swedish with swedish yeah. students you can do this in the czech republic when you reach b1 level you can study for free in czech at czech universities okay so that's a great motivation for everyone who wants to learn Czech. That sounds good. That sounds good. Mm. And maybe if I can add one more thing, what I think that really makes learning effective is to, and you spoke about it already, is to connect the language with real life. I think this is a problem at schools that they completely, um, what's the word? Um, like they make two, there are two separate categories, your real life, your family, your friends, the funny things you do in life and the language learning and the classes and the subjects. So yeah. what I think really works is to take it from the other side and start with the fun things, as you said, right? And then connecting it with the language. So finding things that you really like doing, that you really enjoy and do it in your target language. So if you like yoga classes and you take some classes online, do it in your target language instead of English and really um, enjoy the process. Because if you don't enjoy it, it's not sustainable in the long term, I think. Would you recommend different approaches depending on the mother tongue of someone? So if I speak Ukrainian or Polish, those languages are closer to Czech than, for instance, uh, Mandarin or German or Spanish. I don't teach Slavs. I've never taught Slavs, so I don't really have specific recommendations. But generally said, we know based on research that the human brain makes use of native grammatical structures and it's also... Yeah. It's logical, right? When you speak, when you are a Pole or a Ukrainian, it's going to be much easier for you to learn Czech than for an American because you already know what cases are declensions. You understand mm -hmm. all the changes, um, conjugations. So <clears throat> what I try to do with my American students that have no idea, no clue what declensions are, is to connect it somehow with their native language because I think that mm -hmm. The human brain likes to connect new information to stuff that it already knows. Mm -hmm. uh, it likes to connect things. It likes stories, uh, context, imagination. So if you just tell them um, to an English speaker, so in Czech, when you want to say, I am 20 years old, you say, je uh, dvacet, and they say, okay, je dvacet. But if you tell them, in English, you say, I am 20 years old, but in Czech, the perspective is totally different because you say, the age is happening to me. And it, I think it really starts making sense because then you also understand not only the language, but also a little bit the mentality mm -hmm. of the nation. This is how, yeah. I, how, I, um, how I see it. Because in my perspective or in my point of view, it's something a little bit, there is something a little bit passive in this construction. Like, okay, the age is happening to me. It's not my fault. I'm getting older. But in English, it's like, okay, it's me who's getting older. I have to fight it and I have to uh, <laughs> deal with that. So I always try to connect like Czech grammatical structures to English and show them how it works in English, how it works in yeah. Czech so that they understand the logic and the meaning behind it. And if I have a German speaker, then I don't have to tell them because uh, you also have these expressions, right? Like, um, mir ist kalt, uh, es macht mir Spaß. So, mm. Mm, yeah, it's it's different. It's so it's definitely different to work with Slavs when you learn when you teach Czech or with um, Americans, for example. 
Okay, so you can <clears throat> take the, the basics that the person already knows, the roots that they have, what they already understand, which kind of concepts, how they speak, how they uh, create sentences, and then build on that and try to connect, check to their experiences and explain the different ways, as you said, I never looked at it that way, age is happening to, to me, or I can decide how old I am, or I have to influence it uh, and slow it down maybe, or not, depending on the goal mm -hmm. there. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. And how is it with, with different age groups? Do you have any experiences there? Is it different? So I would assume that the approach can be different to when we talk about a 12 year old or a 30 year old or a 55 year old or 70 year old. And do you have any experiences there? And what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. uh, again, I've never taught kids, so I don't mm -hmm. really have any experiences here. But when we speak about a 30 years old and a 50 years old person, I don't really see a difference because mm -hmm. uh, I think that everybody is unique. I don't see a difference as a teacher because I approach everybody in the same way. So I ask everybody and it's it doesn't matter if they are 30 or 50. I always ask them about how do you like to learn? What's your goal? How would you like to approach this? And I take the information from them. So I don't think there is like one general approach that should be applied to a specific age group. But mm -hmm. I think that everybody should like think about their own ideal ways of learning. I don't know how you see it. If you um, if you feel like there there is a different approach or way of learning for different age groups, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I understand your <clears throat> highly individual approach. Uh, and I would also go with that. When we talk about differences between maybe children and um, like 30 year olds or 50 year olds, I think what you can do with children more easily is just take them and put them into a surrounding on a playground with other kids who speak that language. So mm. um, our daughter, uh, she's still too young to speak, uh, but she will be learning Czech and she will be learning German. And we travel quite often to Italy. And the idea there is that when she is in Italy, she will play with other kids and they will speak Italian. And the, the kids are in that sense, um, especially in the younger years, like sponges and they just absorb it and passively they don't say okay i have to sit down now i have to learn this language but they use it as a tool so they need the shovel or they need uh they want to play here with the sand castle and so on so they find a way almost automatically with a less effort than it would be needed for adult people for adults still i would say put them in a surrounding and a system where they have to use the language where they don't have the chance just to switch to their mother tongue because it's so easy we mm -hmm. had that in Sweden as well. Many people went there and said, okay, in Sweden, I will learn Swedish. But then you have these groups. Those mm -hmm. are the Germans, there are the Spanish. And you just like magnetically, you form these groups. And yeah, the friction is very high to, to learn the language if you're not automatically um, in that situation. So I would really set up the system there. And for everyone who wants to learn Czech, try to, for me, I would recommend or I would prefer to live in the Czech Republic. Um, just to use it daily, just to hear it, mm. uh, not to think about it actively, just to be exposed to it. Um, so I think that's something I wanted to to ask you. So in a way, complete language immersion, right? Dive into that new ecosystem, forget your mother tongue in a, in a way. Okay, you can still, of course, talk to your family um, if they don't <laughs> speak. The Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, tr try to, try to um, ramp up the usage and would you, yeah, so this is what I wanted to ask you. Uh, would you recommend, and if so, at what stage in learning, would you recommend to change the mobile phone to the language, to a target language, um, change the radio, watch only movies in that target language that you're trying to learn, um, and so on, especially if you don't live in that country? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I would do it because I think the problem with, again, traditional teaching system is that we have one class during the week, mm. 60 minutes or 90 minutes, or maybe two classes. Okay. But that's not enough. When little kids, as you said, learn languages, they, they have so much input every day and they, they learn the, they hear the language every day so many times. And I think this is something that we can imitate and that we can learn from children, like having a lot of input in the target language and really surround ourselves 
with the target language so that we have somewhere to take from. I think this is the problem with traditional teaching and learning systems that we have very little material that we can use um, to create our sentences because we don't hear it. We, go, we don't absorb it as sponges, as, as you said. Mm. So I think we need the input so that we then start to remembering, oh, I heard that once. Maybe I can use it in this context because it sounds yeah. like a similar situation and you don't sometimes you don't even understand the grammar you don't you don't understand the rules but you just use it because you feel it's right and it's yeah. it's correct in this specific situation so yeah i would definitely recommend it i would recommend learning like kids for maybe 80 percent and then a little bit like adults, like learning a little bit about the grammar, about the rules, but maybe from 20%, but not the other way around. Okay. So we should meet at the play playground more often and yeah. try to communicate <laughs> in another language. And uh, also one thing that came to my mind when you spoke about the, the kids at the playground and the shovel, when they have a problem and they are unable to express it with words, they start to cry or they hit the other kid right and obviously it's not the perfect solution or it's not not the the perfect way how to solve the situation but they mm. solve it they use gestures hands their voice it doesn't necessarily necessarily needs to be the language or the words or perfect grammar so this is also something we can learn from from kids like use other techniques to communicate and not only the language and perfect flawless language yeah and I would say that gives you fantastic feedback if you're able to communicate and if you get to the point um, where you have this huge feeling of success uh, that you, in a language that's not your mother tongue, was were able to discuss something or agree on who gets the shovel or not. Um, even though sometimes we need gestures, that's totally fine and legit. And maybe later on you can use the words. Yeah, you said um, this this feeling that something I would also like to to underline to feel how it should be, uh, which word to use or which declensions you discuss. So a weekend, for instance, we talked about that. Oh, weekend do. Um, there's a you there. And this happens when you are exposed more often to native speakers. So you should you use the language in a correct way. So at some point, um, you don't have to think of all these charts and tables that in theory you have in your textbooks and you can learn. For me, it didn't work so well. Um, and then, yeah, when you try to and start to speak more from the heart and automatically that's where the real fun, I would say, begins. Okay. Would you um, recommend any apps to support your language learning? There is one app that I love and I recommend it to everyone even though it doesn't fit uh, them all, of course. And it's the same one that you mentioned in our interview. It's Anki. Okay. Uh, this app is called on, uh, is based on the so-called spaced repetition system. So you have like traditional paper flashcards, but it's in your mobile app. Mm. And um, you practice effectively because they only show you based on this special algorithm. I have no idea how it works. Uh, only the cards that are new or difficult. So you don't have to spend hours every day practicing everything that's in your, um, yeah. how do they call it in the app? The deck that's in your deck, but you only practice what's new and what's what's difficult. So it's an effective way of practicing vocabulary. I used it for Spanish. It was an amazing tool. And yeah. I always recommend to my clients who learn Czech to work with complete phrases or expressions or sentences. So not to learn isolated words, but always words in context. So instead of learning uh, the weekend, weekend, learning during the weekend or weekend do so that they also automatically learn the endings, the grammar, natural expressions, everything is in one package. You don't really divide grammar and vocabulary. Everything is uh, there and if you, if you learn it, if you learn it by heart, you can then just take it out of your brain and use it like this when you speak. Spaced repetition really seems to be highly effective and it's not so intimidating, I would say, because back in the day I used to write down all the all the vocabulary in the cards and then you had like huge decks and you would see them like, oh, maybe tomorrow until you just have the app 
And there you have, I don't know, 20, 20 mm -hmm. words of phrases today. Okay, I can do that. that. That works. And you have your phone most of the time. Most people do at least. Um, those that have a smartphone, which would be most people by now, at least in the Czech Republic and in Germany. And then, yeah, for me, that also works pretty well. As you mentioned in our previous interview, um, that you use these like little breaks or little times during your day. You have five minutes here. You can take out your phone and you can practice. And I think that's the key, like finding your ways of doing it, because I think that very little people can find 30 minutes or one hour, 90 minutes to really sit down to focusly study. But if you have your phone with um, your cards, you can study like in, in small chunks. Then you have this, this mm. constant exposure to the language and it, it try to try to reduce the amount of motivation you need to actually get to the studying. Just put it out, study a little bit and then move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there, when we talk about learning a new language, especially Czech or Spanish, as you have experiences with that as well, uh, more effectively and more efficiently, anything else that you did not yet mention that you would like to add? Maybe one more thing uh, that's connected to Anki, and then I will add some other things. What has been really helpful for me with Spanish uh, and Anki was to use expressions and sentences from my real life conversation. So I wouldn't download mm -hmm. random expressions from the internet or random lists of vocabulary made by other people, but I would use what I've heard in conversations with my own friends or in movies, and I would put it in Anki. So then when the card popped up, I would immediately think about my friend, about our conversation that we had. I would imagine her face. I would remember the atmosphere. And then it was much easier for me to remember than if it was just some random code thing created by somebody else. So that's my recommendation uh, for Anki. So, so you have emotions and situations linked to that. And you write down by yourself these phrases and sentences mm -hmm. works better, I would agree, than just downloading <laughs> a set. I tried that with another app called Quizlet. Um, mm -hmm. You have all these decks. I don't think they use spaced repetition, but you can download for the Cheshina Express, the workbook that I use, download decks. But the people that created it do it differently than you would. And you didn't go through the process of creating it. So it's it's very abstract, it's very distant, very, very foreign to you. And that didn't work at all for me. So take the time, I would agree, write down from your own personal life what you need to learn, what you hear people say frequently. So when you're at a bar or anywhere else and there's a discussion you cannot follow, okay, that's fine. But just take some notes, um, write it down, and then put it in the app. And then you can remember that situation. That works fantastically. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah, definitely. And also it ha it happened to me many times that there was one card that kept popping up and I wasn't able to remember it. And then I thought, I don't need it. I don't want to use this word. And I just deleted it. And it was so liberating because then again, I, I was this, like I was the boss of my own learning process and it yeah. felt so great. Like I was selective. I was only picking stuff that I liked, that I wanted to learn expressions, vocabulary that I wanted to learn. So that was something also that I found very useful to narrow down what we learn and not to try to learn everything. To, to identify the words that are most frequent. I have similar experiences. I had the topic of uh, taxes, uh, which there, there are some specific words that you need and also insurances. And there are so many different forms of taxes and I just couldn't remember all of them and I thought, I don't need that on a daily basis, so I will need it someday. So if it's passive knowledge, that's fine for now. And then the rest, I will maybe, I will come back to that uh, when I feel like it. One final question before that, let me let me try to, to summarize what you said, what you would focus on, right? So you have an individual approach, so everyone learns differently. You would take into consideration one's history. So the mother tongue, try to link it. You would um, definitely try to, uh, immerse a person in that language to expose them to the language use it as a tool very important not try to learn the language for the language sake but identify the motivation the why behind it because that drives you to continue and not to stop when it gets hard because it will get hard at some point right uh, you can use support from of course teachers you can buy courses you have your own course there and you can use apps like anki 
um, that really help you manage it in the in the stress and hectic of daily life uh, when you want to learn language because these isolated mm -hmm. chunks of time 30 minutes one hour it's really hard if you have kids if you have a job if you if you study um, just to sit down in peace and in quiet that rarely happens uh, just to study and try to connect it to your real life find people who you can speak with friends can be family can be colleagues and just use it and don't give up and don't focus on the mistakes focus on what you can say and try to communicate as much as you can as best, best as you can very nicely be... summarized would you like to be my copywriter <laughs> we can talk about it later <laughs> <laughs> okay so my my final question then we uh, wrap this uh, short interview up uh, what would be your recommendation for those that just uh, that have just started out or those that feel stuck they have tried it for several weeks months even years and they just they don't seem to be getting anywhere mm -hmm. so if i was to learn a new language at this moment i would not repeat the mistake that i made with all of my languages english german and spanish and i would start just by listening and learning about the sounds of the language because what mm -hmm. i did was that i started by reading seeing the letters seeing the text and trying to somehow pronounce it and of course i would project my own czech pronunciation rules and systems into the new language so i learned many mistakes many pronunciation mistakes that i am not even aware of or i am but it's very difficult to get rid of them so in english mm -hmm. i apply czech rhythm i know about it i should work on that so if I was starting with a new language, I would start just by listening, repeating and imitating the native speakers so that I get used to the sounds of the language, to the melody, to the rhythm. And then I would uh, look how it's written. So, for example, you as a German speaker, if you see the Czech word Muslim and you are a beginner, you automatically, I think, pronounce it as Muslim because mm -hmm. this is how you do it in German. But if you hear it first many times, misli, 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 it's it gets in your brain, in your muscle memory, and then you already know how to pronounce it correctly. And then even though you see it written down, you can already see, okay, so in Czech it's S, in German it's it's Z. So this is my, my recommendation for people who are beginning with Czech. And for more advanced learners who've been learning for weeks or months, but they get somehow stuck. I have two uh, recommendations. The first one is to think about what's your goal and to narrowing down your focus. Because I think that sometimes we try to learn everything and we feel overwhelmed and we don't know where to even start. But if we define a very specific and narrow down goal, so let's say you in uh, two months, if your daughter is already older, you want to be able to speak with your wife in Czech about your baby and about what you did, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you have this specific uh, goal, you can then think about your actions. Okay, so what do I need to do uh, to reach my goals? I need probably some specific expressions, vocabulary. Is there some grammar I need for that? I need somebody to practice with, right? And you already know what to do and where to start. So it's not this huge, like, overwhelm. I need to learn Czech, but it's okay. This is my goal. This is how I get there. Yeah. So this is the first recommendation. And my uh, second recommendation is a technique that I learned from my friend and a language coach, Eva Piechkova. I learned it many years ago. I'm still using it with my clients. If you are, uh, if you get stuck, you can take a piece of paper and you write everything that you currently do on the left side. So you write, mm -hmm. I listen to the news and I do some grammar exercises and I listen to the radio, blah, blah, blah. And then you write uh, your goals or your problems on the right side. So your goal is mm -hmm. to speak with my mother-in-law or to improve my um, comprehension skills because I don't really understand when people speak, right? Or I want to improve my pronunciation. And then you look at these two sides and you can connect it. And ideally, everything that you do should be somehow related to your goals or to your preferences. Mm -hmm. And it really helps you see what you currently do, what you want to achieve, and if there is something you need to change. So maybe there is something that you do 
that's totally like doesn't make any sense for your goals or there is something maybe that's missing right so typically people want to speak but there is no speaking on the left side so yeah this is a great technique that i can recommend if people get stuck i've never mm -hmm. used that one but i have gotten stuck in the past so <laughs> i think I'll try it next time that happens to everyone else what are your experiences when learning a new language how was it in school what were negative, positive aspects? How did you like it? What would you do differently? And how would you learn a language more effectively and efficiently? Do you agree with Elishka and myself? Do you have a different approach? Let us know. And if you have any questions for me or for Elishka, you can write it down in the comments on my channel, on her channel. That doesn't matter. Reach out to you and we will try to answer it. And maybe if there are more topics to discuss, we can do this again someday. This was a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Elishka. Thank you Any for having words? me. Any final words from your side? No, I think I'm done. I, I spoke too much. So thank you <laughs> very much and see you in another interview, hopefully. Thank you very much. See, see you. you. Bye. -bye. Bye.